and Harvard created the foundational studies during that time that said that obesity wasn't caused by sugar. And that led to the food uh, you know, pyramid, right, that's caused, I would say, the, the most violence to children and the American people of any public policy document in American history. This is a subject I'm very, very passionate about. You know, we start off with very um, altruistic means as far as like feeding Americans, feeding the world. And so part of that has been government assistance. And I'm speaking from a place of experience. I'm one of those kids who grew up getting food stamps. I mean, you know, my family getting food stamps in order to, to feed our family. And my mom worked overnight at a convenience store and we was just doing a lot of different things to make ends meet. But we were just inundated also by processed foods. And I don't think people really realize how much of something that could be well-meaning like government assistance is actually feeding processed food consumption and in particular soda consumption. Can you talk about the state of affairs with that? Yeah, Sean, you've had a lot of doctors, nutrition experts, um, on your show that have really impacted me. Not a lot of former political consultants, but I do think this is an important perspective because what's happening in these back rooms really does impact the incentives of our food. Yeah. And as you said, uh, food stamps is one example. So this is a nutrition program. It's $110 billion. And 15% of the American people depend on this for nutrition. Um, so it's a very important program. And 10% of that funding goes to sugary drinks. It's a material part of Coke and Pepsi's revenue, and 70% go to processed foods. And then you go outside that, you go to school lunches, the billions of dollars we spend on school lunches, federally and, and state funded, the, the tens of billions of dollars of grain and food subsidies. There, there's over $100 billion a year, well over, of government incentives that are really slanting us to a, to a processed food system. and. Uh, and it was disheartening, you know, now I'm very passionate about changing those incentives, but early in my career, I was a consultant for these food companies and saw inside the room and it was, it was dispiriting how they rigged institutions of trust. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fascinating the lengths they go to. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's under the guise of feeding Americans and offering free choice, but it's not really free choice. And you've really been speaking out about that in a big way and it's been mind blowing and incredible to see, and, and incredible to see. but. I think it's really powerful because you've been in those rooms yeah. and you've heard the conversations. And from my perspective, and also based on the data, like for example, I, I talked about this in my mm. most recent book. There was a study that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine, one of our most prestigious medical journals, Journal of the American Medical Association. And they did a huge meta-analysis looking at the outcomes from the consumption of government subsidized foods, right? And so these are people who are consuming the highest percentages of you know what would be getting government subsidies, which just in a, a 20 year time span they looked at is about almost $200 billion going towards foods that largely come through the drive through window, right? So sugar, various forms of sugar, in particular from corn, from wheat and the like. And they found that the people who had the highest consumption of government subsidized foods had the highest rate of obesity. In particular, almost 40% increased risk of developing obesity, insulin resistance, and they were also measuring inflammation as well in this study by CRP and finding essentially government subsidy programs are feeding disease in our country. And so the framing for me living in those conditions is that the system is structured in a way that could be looked at as structural racism, right? And this is a trigger word that's been used in the reverse to help to protect companies like Coca-Cola. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and a stat that, and the reason I'm speaking out on this is one from the perspective of a, of a dad. I mean, this is disproportionately impacting kids. 25% of kids now have prediabetes. And, and just to add to another stat that you're talking about, a uh, lower income man born in this country dies 15 years younger than a, the upper, most upper income man. And uh, it's, it's inconscionable. And you really tie back, tie what that's from. It's really predominantly around nutrition. And, you know, going into the room, um, you know, there was a couple, couple playbook tactics that Coke used, and it really revolved around um, rigging institutions of trust. So, so, so the fundamental first principle that these companies are asking around a boardroom in these consulting offices is who does our communities and do various politicians trust and who can we pay? 
So, you know, the first one I talked about is the NAACP and other civil rights groups. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you call someone racist, uh, it shuts down debate. And it was really a chilling and dispiriting optics having these old Coke executives, you know, telling the NAACP, you know, who to call racist. And there was this report in the New York Times at the time in 2012, there was millions of dollars of funds exchanged. And the NAAC, the NAACP said that parents who were, you know, questioning whether kids should have subsidized soda, uh, the, the word race, racist was uh, thrown around a lot. And, uh, and that did shut down debate, and that did in 2012 when this was up for debate, and a lot of members of Congress were questioning the logic of paying for diabetes water for kids. You know, um, sugar consumption among kids is up 100x in 100 years. Um, that was kept in food stamp funding, and, and to this day, it's 10% of food stamps funding goes to sugary drinks. Um, but there's other institutions as well. Um, you know, there's also just direct payoffs to medical groups. Uh, the American Association of Nutritionists, the association that literally credentials nutritionists, the uh, organization that you can actually lose your license as a nutritionist if you go against their guidelines, uh, have been directly funded by Coke. Um, they've actually endorsed small cans of Cokes as a, as a good nutrition move. And then there's direct uh, bribes, consulting fees from Coke and other processed food makers, millions of dollars a year to nutritionists. Um, you know, then you've got the news media. Um, as I've been on this kick recently, you know, there's been, you know, dozens and dozens of independent media reaching out. But uh, food, and, and we can talk about later, uh, pharmaceuticals, which, which I would say profit from our, our deadly food system, um, are the two of the top biggest advertisers for news media. And, uh, and I saw, and we actually uh, had an orchestrated strategy to help Coke and plan out a strategy of advertising to influence the debate on um, uh, on how the media covered this, um, and uh, research institutions. Um, I think this is the most important one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about this uh, a lot, but uh, Coke and processed food makers fund nutrition research in this country 11 times more than the NIH. And um, you know, I'm a I'm a Harvard grad, but I, I you know I want to be very plain spoken about this. I think the most deadly nutritional or really any type of research study ever conducted was a Harvard study. Um, in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the head of the Harvard uh, Nutrition Department uh, was on the payroll of the sugar companies. At th that time, they didn't even try to hide the name. It was called the Sugar Research Institute. And Harvard created the foundational studies during that time that said that obesity wasn't caused by sugar. And this completely fallacious idea of you know every calorie being the same. And that led to the food, uh, you know, pyramid, right? That's caused, I would say, the, the most violence to children and the American people of any public policy document in American history. You know, American carbohydrate percentage as a, as a percentage of our total diet has went up 20% in the next five years after that was released. Wow. Our healthy fat uh, percentage plummeted. And I think you can really tie that to the devastation and all these random conditions we're facing right now and chronic disease, autoimmune conditions, allergies, things like that. Um, it would be hopeful if that wasn't still the case, but now the foundational nutritional research from the NIH and Tufts University, millions of dollars of government funding, it was also funded by food companies. It's called the Food Compass. And, and just recently that recommended that um, Lucky Charms were three times healthier than eggs and honey nut cherries was healthier than beef. So, so we really do have, and I, I can just tell you, um, you know, nutrition research institutions at elite universities are PR operations for food companies. I don't think they know that uh, all of the time, but the, the goal is to confuse. The goal is to obfuscate. Yeah, man, this, it's, it's terrifying, but also it's empowering to know this information because Oftentimes, again, we, we want to do what's best for ourselves, for our families, and we're leaning on higher institutions of higher learning and reputable research, right? And so when you hear the name like Harvard, for example, we think, okay, this is top tier science coming from this institution, when in reality, we've got to understand, and if you could share this, when we're talking about the most prestigious universities, you know, across the country, really across the world, mm -hmm. and for if we're looking at medical programs and understanding how important nutrition is in overall health, the vast majority of medical programs don't even require 
our physicians to, to learn anything about nutrition. Well, yeah, I'll say a story that had a huge impact on my life. Uh, Dr. Casey Means, who you've done the show, is, is my sister and it has had a huge impact on me. And I was, you know, I grew up very conservative and, you know, talking about how American medical innovation and food innovation was the best in the world and, and not questioning any of these systems. And I've really been on a journey myself. And, um, you know, a formative story for me, you know, Casey was, um, you know, an illustrious career uh, along the, the institutions we all look up to, top of her class at, at Stanford Med School and a, and a head and neck surgeon. And she was looking down at a patient um, in her final uh, year of residency, it was her third sinusitis surgery of the day. She was cutting out the inflammation, you know, of a passed out patient, you know, who had inflamed sinuses. And she had this out of body experience, she said, where she did not understand why that patient passed out before her had inflammation. And she tied it back, you know, to Stanford Med School, right? One of the, one of the best institutions we have and realized that they did not teach doctors why people actually get sick. And then you actually trace the money on that. You, you can actually tie more than 50% of major medical school funding somehow to pharma. These schools rely a lot on research funding and grants and other types of things like that. And pharma has their hands everywhere. So is the Dean of Stanford Medical School an evil person trying to rig the system? No, but we just have to step back and not make this personal. Incentives matter. Food companies spending billions of dollars on nutrition research matters. They're trying to get something. Pharma and, and, and private interests funding 70% plus of all you know, foundational research in this country, they are trying to get something. And what they're getting at med schools is, as you alluded to, 80% to this day do not require doctors to graduate with one nutrition class. Mm. And uh, the vast majority of medical school curriculum is on pharmacology. Now, let's just think about that. Let's step back and just first principles. What should doctors be taught? What should our healthcare system be asking? One would think it would be how to keep people healthy, but that is not the question. Doctors are trained to be heroes once people get sick, right? It's this narrative of standing heroically there with the prescription pad and the scalpel. That's how 95% of medical funding you know, and, and spending currently happens. It's once somebody's sick. That actually doesn't make any sense, right? It, it's a convenient, complete silence on the f why 50% of folks now have prediabetes or diabetes. Why 25% of children have prediabetes right now? Why autoimmune diseases are off the chart? Why 15% of children now have fatty liver disease? Why, you know, allergies? Everything is is happening at once and it's manifestly because of food, but that is complete and utter silence. You know, the American Academy of Pediatrics was nowhere to be found in 2012 when Coke got their food stamp funding kept for, for uh, you know, sugary drinks. But they're being very vocal right now, now that there's a miracle obesity cure, right? Now that the CDC report in 2021 that 40% of kids between 5 and 12 are now obese because of rigged systems like this, now there's a cure, right? Now there's this weekly obesity injection. And now the American Academy of Pediatrics is speaking very loudly that 40% of teenagers should be getting a weekly injection miracle cure, which obviously is not going to work. Oh, my gosh. And again, it's just kind of perpetuating this system. We got to talk about this, quote, miracle cure. Yeah. That is, you know, it's, it's, it's grabbing a lot of headlines right now. But most importantly... And mo most viscerally, it's being used right now as a go-to treatment right. for issues that are actually caused by the way that we live our lives. So I call it the devil's bargain between, and, and this is really what I'm trying to devote my life to, but the devil's bargain between food and health. I think it's obvious when you look at the statistics in America right now, food is dramatically impacting our health and making us much sicker, more depressed, more infertile fatter at an increasing rate, right? But then the medical system now is the largest and the fastest growing industry in the United States, which is just staggering to wrap your head around. It's profiting from the fact that so many people are sick, that that system only makes money for interventions. And I think the important thing to think about when we think about this miracle obesity cure, let's not be reflexively anti-drug, but let's just look at the data. Let's look at the history of our medicalization of chronic conditions. The drugs act on a specific symptom, but it's 
all, they're all correlated with increased disease overall. The more stands we prescribe, the more heart disease goes up. The more metformin we prescribe, the more we've seen diabetes increase. The more SSRIs we prescribe, which is the most highly prescribed drug in the United States, the more depression and suicide go up. My hypothesis is that it's because heart disease is much deeper than your cholesterol levels. You know, diabetes represents much more than you know, your, your fasting glucose levels, you're fundamentally with these conditions, they're warning signs of a much more basic issue that you're feeding your body inflammatory foods, you're feeding your body, you know, 100 times more sugar than we did our evolutionary supposed to have. And there's, there's, there's fundamental dysfunction that's presenting itself in a number of different different symptoms. So obesity, right? So imagine it works perfectly. Imagine it you know, you, you do this weekly injection and the child eats less and loses weight. That child is still eating canola oil and sugar, you know, and, and seed oils. If that child is still feeding their body primarily with inflammatory processed foods, that's still causing violence to their cells, right? If they're still living a sedentary lifestyle, they're still in a, you know, l limited sun room all day, right? So, so, so without, by making patients think that they're taking an action and not talking about the underlying root cause of disease, right? Um, it actually is a moral hazard because it makes people think that they're doing something when they're not. So so that's my worry uh, with this miracle obesity cure. I, I do not think it's going to lead to a long-term decrease in obesity. I think it's actually going to lead to uh, additional uh, diseases because it's not going to prevent the, the root cause of inflammatory foods. And that's not even getting into the very concerning side effects of the drug itself. Yeah. So number one, just to, to summarize that, yeah. it was so, so powerful. Mm. We're not actually removing the cause of the issue, right? So which would seem the logical thing to do. Instead, we're coming up with more interventions in the form of pharmaceutical drugs to treat a symptom. And this one, Ozempic, for example, again, this is what we're talking about as far as this miracle cure. And people might have seen the commercials at this point and the f different features on there, places like 60 Minutes doing a feature on this. But this particular drug targets one satiety hormone in particular, GLP-1, mm. right? So glucagon-like peptide 1, which funny enough, in my latest book, I talked about GLP-1 and CCK and some of these other satiety-based hormones. And so what this one does is it makes us feel fuller. That's one of its roles. And it also has this propensity towards keeping food in our stomach longer, mm -hmm. like it slows down digestion. Now, funny enough, guess what else does that? And this was published in the Journal of Endocrinology, one of our most prestigious journals. We'll put this up for everybody. Chlorophyll does that as well. Chlorophyll has that same action on GLP-1 without the side effects. And we could be encouraging our families to include more green leafy vegetables in their diet or we get into the system where, again, we're, we're, we're dealing with now the approach of creating lifetime customers right? versus when this pharmaceutical model began, it was more so for the treatment of acute issues. I think this is a good place for us to start right here mm -hmm. in this conversation about drug companies. Again, can start with the, an, an altruistic premise, but then evolving into creating a revolving door of disease treatment and making trillions of dollars yeah i've been uh diving deep into this and and i think it's instructive to look before 1960 there were no chronic pharmaceuticals for chronic conditions you know when we think about the the greatness of a of american medicine we usually think about acute interventions before 1960 so these are emergency surgical procedures to you know save uh, a complicated childbirth you know appendicitis bypass surgeries um, or, you know, things like antibiotics, which you take, you're cured, you're done, vaccines. Um, starting with the birth control bill. The birth control bill was the first chronic treatment. Um, and it actually, uh, Arthur Sackler, who, who gave birth to the, 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 the folks that started Purdue Pharma, he was, the, he was the patriarch of that family, was the marketing executive in the 1960s who saw the birth control bill. He's like, how do we commercialize other chronic conditions? So he led to the first blockbuster, Valium. And he was the marketing genius behind Valium, which in the uh, 60s and 70s, 25% of women in the United States were on due to his very sexist advertising, actually. You can dig into that. 
And then, you know, to today, where 95% of spending is now on chronic conditions. And as we talked about, that's only led to an explosion of chronic conditions <laughs> themselves right. um, because we've been, I think, totally systematically uh, distracted from what the root cause of this whole thing is. But getting into Zimpic and your, you know, kind of back, back to my background, I mean, the 60 Minutes special three weeks ago that told America that obesity is a not part of lifestyle choice but a genetic condition ignoring the fact entirely that this is only an issue in the past 50 years uh was absolutely shameful but a perfect example of the playbook on all fronts so you had literally before and after that segment pharmaceutical ads pharmaceutical companies are more than 50 percent of 60 minutes advertising okay so you you have that situation imagine the incentives of them running an anti-pharma piece versus taking the call and running this piece. You know, again, with that with that good spin, with, oh, kids are suffering, this is gonna help them, right? Okay, then the doctors speaking on that who were billed as unbiased experts on the payroll of Ozempic. The Ozempic parent company, and this is on the CMS uh, government website, has been paying out $30 million a year for the past several years to almost every obesity doctor that they can find. And what does that mean for the obesity doctors? Again, this is a lifetime appointment for them. The, 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 but, but, the, but the real evilness of the system at a high level is that it makes good individuals say that they're helping when this is, does anyone think this is really gonna help the underlying dynamics of why so many kids are sick? Um, so yeah, you've got, you've got people paid off, you've gotta follow the money on all fronts. And then, you know, the, the, the peace to the resistance is the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is the, this is the association that credentials uh, pediatricians. It is the gold standard. You will lose your license for going against the American Academy of Pediatrics. When you're a new parent, you get a booklet and, and you're fearful as a parent for going against their guidelines. It's right on the website. The majority of their funding comes from pharmaceutical makers and they, after being paid off directly by pharmaceutical companies, have said that every obese teenager should be recommended for this drug. So it's, um, again, this is a, <laughs> you can listen to this and, and and be kind of despondent. And to be honest, I was despondent digging into this with Casey last year and, and really thinking about how to make this my life's work. To me, understanding these things is a key step to empowerment because We've been gaslighted by these organizations to not ask questions, yeah. right? Trust the science. Don't question your pediatrician. I, I, you know, every person that goes on a health podcast, you know, will give a disclaimer to consult your doctor. I will say this: when it comes to chronic conditions, you, you should be very skeptical of what these medical organizations are telling us. They don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. We should be empowered patients, listen to our doctor, take their considerations. But when it comes to preventing chronic conditions, we should really be thinking from first principles. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for having the audacity to say that. Because again, ask your doctor, trust your doctor. What if your doctor doesn't know? What if, for example, your doctor is a cardiologist and they've spent 12 years in their education and paid six figures to get that very prestigious degree? And yet they don't understand when they're looking at their, their patient's scans, they're looking at an EKG or they're looking at a heart monitor or they're, they're doing different analysis to look at their heart function. They're measuring their blood. If they don't understand that that heart is made from food, that what's running through their patient's blood is made from food, they're missing the point of like a foundational understanding of what they're actually seeing. They're looking at something superficial if they don't understand nutrition. And so to ask your doctor when they have no idea in some context of what they're actually dealing with, it is, it, it's not the best advice. Now with that said, and you've shared this as well, yeah. our system is incredible in the treatment for emergency issues. 100%. And acute things, wonderful, we, we need that training. However, there's a lot more money on that end than in prevention and getting folks educated and talking to their patient, hey, you know what? Your blood is made out of the food that you're eating. Let's actually do something to address your nutrition and make your blood healthier. And part of that, and this goes back to something you shared earlier, about 80% of medical programs, medical school right. programs, don't require anything in nutrition, number one. And 
The 20% that do, what kind of education are they getting because it's being funded by General Mills? Yeah, and I, I think it is a little bit, I think listeners would be right to say it's a little bit audacious for me with no medical background. You know, as I said, a former political consultant, now an entrepreneur to be saying, you know, be skeptical of your doctor. And I'm saying that because it was so disheartening to sit in a public relations office in Washington, D.C. and see lists that included the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Heart Association, you know, the American Diabetes Association. And these were pawns. These were pawns uh, to use to weaponize trusting as the American people. Just one example there that's very instructive to me is around this time of the food stamp debate in 2012, Coke gave millions of dollars to the American Diabetes Association. The Coca-Cola logo was on the American Diabetes Association website with recipes. Dr. Lustig and others have pointed this out. Um, and there, there, you know, there's contemporary um, from the time reporting on this. And what did that get them? Complete silence, obviously, is the cells and metabolic functioning of children was has absolutely been annihilated. You know, the, the greatest violence I could imagine to children, 25% prediabetes rate, absolutely inconscionable. But what else did it get? Until 2018, the American Diabetes Association, their guidance was that if you took insulin, if you took the pharma drugs, you could, did not have to change your diet. They literally said you could continue eating any processed food as high sugar as you wanted as long as you took your insulin, which is medically inconscionable. And again, folks can listen to me or, you know, I, I encourage everyone to make up their own mind, but I don't think it takes a medical degree to understand that if you're eating high sugar, highly inflammatory processed food, and that is fueling your body, then that could result in other dynamics and metabolic dysfunction that could result in other diseases uh, than just your glucose levels. And I think it's why 99% of people with diabetes have at least one other comorbidity, most many more, because this metabolic dysfunction, this, this, this bad fuel we're getting and, and other, other metabolic factors like sleep, sedentary behavior, chronic stress, that's the underpinning of disease. So yeah, um, th that's why I, I, I feel confident saying, you know, to potentially be skeptical when you're a doctor, again, as you correctly point out, when it comes to prevention of chronic conditions, there's a systematic effort for us not to ask questions. And I would say for us not to have awe about the connections between our body, you know, mm. to, to not yeah. to not have curiosity when we're given a mandatory sheet from the Amer American Academy of Pediatrics for new parents saying that the first food a child eats should be processed grains. <laughs> like, yeah. is that evolutionarily what a child's made to eat? I, you know, that, that is that is by the guidelines of the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics, that's what new parents get. Yeah, it's utter nonsense. Yeah. But it, again, it perpetuates the system. You know, we start sho shoveling in processed foods as early as possible, which of course are gonna lead to the manifestation of a variety of diseases, and then we've got drugs for that. And you just said something earlier that I wanna circle back to, which is essentially that this new obesity drug has become the standard of care. Mm -hmm. And in particular, for children, like it's part of the standard of care versus helping to create a, a culture of health and getting parents educated, getting kids educated and empowered about what they're eating, about their movement practices and basic things that their genes expect right. from them. And by the way, circling back as well, when you mentioned them framing again, which this is gonna keep happening until we say enough is enough yeah, yeah. and or we just completely mute this nonsense and framing again that genes are the causative agent of their obesity. We're so far past this, and this study, and this was published in PLOS One, Public mm. Library of Science One. The title of the study is, Genetic Factors Are Not the Major Causes of Chronic Diseases. This is just one of many peer-reviewed studies, again, from prestigious entities. So we got, again, who do we listen to for me, I'm looking at what does the majority of data say? Mm -hmm. And studies like this, they're looking, they're doing a meta-analysis and looking at, we're, we're, we keep trying to find genes that are causative diseases and we just can't find them. Our genes, the vast majority of us, and so what the researchers found was that less than 5% of all diseases are caused by genes, by genetic defects. Mm -hmm. 
Now, we can have risk factors associated with certain genes, but they do not guarantee by any form or fashion that you're going to have a disease because of a particular gene. Right. It just doesn't work like that because there are so many different epigenetic controllers determining what your genes are gonna do. One of the biggest ones, and we're talking about this today, is our food. Nutrigenomics, we've got nutrigenomics, we've got nutrigenetics looking at how nutrition, like every bite of food that we eat is impacting our genetic expression. And so if we're talking about the manifestation of obesity, it's not because of the genes, it's what we're exposing our genes to. Yeah, how do we get to this place where if you really just stick your head up for a second, it just is absolutely absurd to be told that we're, we've increased sugar 100x in 100 years, seed oils, which are the top source of fat now in the American diet, were just created 100 years ago, and highly processed grains, which are absolute sugar bombs, and now the basis of the American diet, uh, were, were really just created 100 years ago. Um, so we have this completely like foreign food coming in our bodies. Um, clearly, you know, obesity on down is caused by this food and we're being told by these studies. So, so a, a couple of things to unpack there. First, I just want to make this very clear. And I think we all kind of know this, but I, I want to say it very affirmatively. We need to be extremely skeptical, whether it's from Harvard on down. We need to be very skeptical when we see on the news that there's a peer reviewed study. Um, sitting in these rooms in, in, in DC early in my career, there was a very conscious strategy. It was to fund studies for the sake of studies. The act of confusion in and of itself, the act of contradictory information is the goal. These studies are funded by these companies purposely to come up with ways to see doubt. You know, if any scientist really dives into some of these ridiculous studies saying obesity, which is only 50 years old, is a genetic condition, it's obviously not good science, but they, but it seeds doubt. It's used by 60 Minutes. It's consciously directed. I was just looking back at the world's largest PR firm that uh, helped uh, helped helped uh, really normalize and, and defend cigarettes for a long time. They had a memo which was leaked in a in an expose about how they did PR for the cigarette industry. And in the late 1970s, they said, research is similar to mothers. Everyone respects those, those institutions. And it said in black and white, it said, what we're going to do to see doubt on cigarettes is fund more and more research and work with that research from Harvard and other places to convince the American people that we haven't quite found the answer, that there's still more information that needs to be discovered. This is precisely what's happening with this with this, with this underlying question of why we're getting so sick all the time. It's purposeful, systematic disaggregation and distraction, you know, from the plethora of nutrition schools right now that are producing tens of thousands of nutrition studies. I, I have a policy idea, which is to cut funding and eliminate every nutrition school in this country. My thesis is that it's actually much less complicated. I think people learn more about nutrition from listening to one episode of your podcast than reading these tens of thousands of studies that are being paid for billions of dollars by these companies for the sole purpose of distraction. You know, we are being systematically driven um, to be confused and distracted. Um, and, you know, I, I am encouraged that there is a, a little bit of, a, of an empowerment revolution happening. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I think, I think feeling, feeling okay to, to push back a little bit, feeling okay to say health Nutrition, the root cause of these things might actually be a little bit more simple yeah. than we've been led to believe. It's it's very empowering. That's step one. Step two is this has got to lead to systemic change and policy change because we do have the four trillion dollars of the healthcare system and the you know six trillion dollar food system is stacked against the American the American invasion. Oh my gosh, you know we spend more money on healthcare here. I mean, mm. by I, I think it's more than the other the, the next 10 countries combined here in the US and yet we're also the sickest society in the history of documented humanity and we have the highest rates of obesity the highest rates of mental health conditions the list goes on and on childhood obesity and so something for me and this is another thing that I'm I've been working to do is to impress this upon culture is just mm -hmm. to ask questions just to, to to look at the results we're spending so much how are we doing? Is it working? And clearly, the way that we've gone about things in recent human history is not working. 
and, and I and I want to be clear. And this is, I think, what a lot of people say. What I used to say is like, well, hasn't life expectancy increased double in the past 120 years? Like, ha, you know, there's probably some marginal things we can improve, but you know, hasn't you know, ha, haven't we done okay? I want to address that a little bit because I think that's maybe a maybe a thought some people will have when, when we talk about this uh, doomsday scenario. So, so here's my thoughts on that. We have done a lot of great things in America in the past 120 years. I think a lot of it goes to those acute um, treatments that we talked about, but there's been astounding innovation and progress and, and life expectancy has uh, doubled in the last 120 years. That progress, which we should celebrate, does not mean that we haven't lost our way. And it doesn't mean that we haven't lost our way in a way that actually will be existential if we don't reverse it. And I think actually looking back at the progress we've made, I think the questioning and the constant improvement, you know, is a core part of our system. Um, And I think that when you even analyze life expectancy, you know, even somebody born hundreds of years ago, if they lived, you know, into adulthood, they did live to like, like their 70s, you know, you know, we really actually are, I think, fundamentally, when you look at the data, like the quality of our lives, it really has been like the quality years going down. Yeah. Like we actually are not at like a prominent standpoint right now. Um, so I believe that the strength of our system actually is self-correction. And I, I think this is a very rigged system. But what gives me hope is two things. It's the bottoms up revolution happening. It's people listening to this podcast, buying, you know, purchasing bio wearables, you know, which, which is really new, actually. I mean, you know, still in many states in, the, in this country, patients aren't legally allowed to have their medical records. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there is this systematic prevention of the medical system enabling patients to know anything or have any curiosity about their body. So that that wall is being torn down by biowearables. There's a lot of content coming out now. I think there's a lot of rightful frustration against the system from COVID. So I think there's a bottoms up revolution led, I think, a, a, a lot by by moms, it's just anecdotally from what I'm seeing, who are very frustrated at the, at the classrooms their kids are walking into where the majority of kids are obese. But I also think in, in the end, our system has responded eventually, late, but eventually to math. And I think the math is clear. Um, you know, I come from tech and usually, right, innovation means lower costs, better outcomes. Healthcare is the opposite. Healthcare, the higher, the more we pay, the worse the outcomes. And it's, it's getting to a point where it's, it's literally, we talk about this, but it's going to bankrupt our country. And, and I think, I think we talk about healthcare costs so much that like our eyes gloss over, but like it it truly is like by definition unsustainable and has to change or we're going to cease to exist. It's 20% growing at an increasing rate faster than any other industry of GDP. So it's going to be 40% in 15 years. And there's nothing right now slowing that trend down. We, We all think it's going to change. It's not, we're all getting sicker. So it will either bankrupt our country or we're going to have a radical change. Um, and the radical change, if you believe that, if you believe that by definition an unsustainable system has to change, the only way it changes is by getting back to basics because we're not going to drug our way out of the solution. We actually hear on the news, right, and from our elites that the answer to our health problems is more access to drugs, right. is more right. affordable health care. Affo- and, and you know, a- access for acute issues is a huge problem and, and, and we absolutely should be, but like, no, it is a fundamental reframe of the incentives of healthcare. The problem with healthcare is not that not enough people are not getting enough drugs and not enough doctors, right. that's not the problem. Right. It's actually the definition of insanity, saying that the solution is more of a system that's hurting people. The problem is the fundamental incentive of every single healthcare institution. The incentive is they make money when people get sick. We need to change that incentive. The only way to do that is by, in my opinion, incentivizing and putting food at the center of health, really having curiosity about these interconnections, you know, of the one ton of genetic information that we put in our bodies to these disastrous health outcomes. And I'm actually optimistic. Um, I actually think that change is going to happen much faster than we expect because the math actually will necessitate it. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, and just one of the most interesting things I've seen recently, because I had the same thing, and I yeah. would say this, you know, right. we are living longer, but in fact, 
we're not necessarily living longer. And I've shared this before. We're really dying longer. We're extending suffering. So there has been this age of us sticking around longer as a species the last few decades. Yeah. And, but with great dysfunction and being dependent upon a plethora of pharmaceutical drugs and not having quality of life. That's not what we want. We want long, healthy life. And that is attainable. There are many examples of that. Now, add that to recently, just within the last few years, that trend of our life expectancy going up has now reversed. Uh -huh. And we are the first generation currently that's not going to outlive our predecessors. Right. So even that thing that we can hang our hat on, that we are living longer, has now reversed. Again, signaling that something is severely wrong because at this point in our level of apparent sophistication, there's no way that we should be struggling so much with our health, with all that we apparently know, why is it so difficult to remain healthy? And this brings us back to, and I wanna talk more about this mm -hmm. because we started this episode off talking about, for me again, when I lived in Ferguson, Missouri, when I would step foot outside of my apartment complex, within a mile and a half, two mile radius, there was every fast food right. restaurant that you can name. And I'm not exaggerating in the slightest. Not to mention, as soon as I step out of my apartment complex, there's a liquor store literally right across the street. And there were many others within that two mile radius. And sprinkle in, you know, a couple of like check cashing places that are like 300% mm -hmm. interest and all these different things. Like I was inundated with a system, with, a, with an environment that was screaming at me and pulling at me and, 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 and driving me to be unhealthy. Mm -hmm. All I could see in that environment was dysfunction and disease. That's all I could see. Now, it can be normalized to me where I don't see that that's the thing because I'm a part of it. And at this time, I'm 20 years old. I have a advanced degenerative condition, arthritic condition of my spine and bones. I have chronic asthma and allergies and all of these different things that are just normal. You know, it's just the, the normal thing. Like what kind of issues do you have? And so, but here's the thing, within that, within that same environment, I was able to get educated mm -hmm. and, to, and to learn some things and to sh make tiny shifts like eating real food, you know, go figure, mm -hmm. and starting to make my cells out of better materials mm -hmm. and starting to feel better. And, but here's, here's the thing, this is the rub, is for a lot of that, I had to go outside of my environment. Mm right, whether it's for my education and or to even get access to different types of food. Now, even within that environment, once I've become more sophisticated and I could find the good stuff no matter where I'm at, right? But in that time period, I had to go outside of my environment. I'm, and I'm bringing this up to say that this could be easily framed if we look at who has the highest rates of chronic disease. If we're looking at demographics here in the United States, in particular, minorities, African-Americans and you know, coming in particular, women, African American women having the highest rates of obesity, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. higher rates overall of, of of cancer, of diabetes, the list goes on and on. These are my this is my family. Yeah. You know, my 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 aunts and you know, my grandmothers and <sighs> this can be framed very easily again as this term structural racism, where it's just feeding into itself this disease of dysfunction. And yeah. it's so difficult to get out of it because you don't feel well. Versus using that ploy, you know, in those rooms with Coca-Cola, for example, and saying, hey, if you prevent, if you try to take away somebody's mm -hmm. right to buy ultra processed foods and or buy soda, you're racist. Mm -hmm. If they're getting government assistance, if you take away or have some kind of tax or reduce the amount that they can get, it's because you're racist. You're taking away their ability to choose. Right. Let's talk about that because the ability to choose, I'm a, I'm oh, a yeah. fan of capitalism. Oh yeah. But is this really capitalism that we're seeing? It is a total perversion of capitalism. You do not have a free market if the market is totally rigged. It is not free choice to subsidize diabetes water that has no nutritional value and, by the way, is weaponized with fructose, which is a special kind of sugar that shuts off your hunger cues and is highly addictive. 
to subsidize that with tens of billions of dollars of government funding. Um, and, and, and a couple of thoughts. I mean, listening to that story and listening to what you just said make, makes me very angry. <laughs> um, there are right now, and I was watching videos of this this week, there are food executives and public relations executives at Davos this week pontificating on panels about racial equity. And at the exact same time, they are spending tens of millions of dollars of lobbying and public affairs money to in a back room with a bunch of old white members of Congress, regulators, Coke executives to rig the system so that tens of billions of dollars right, of money is incentivized to put a highly addictive, deadly drug, you know, push this into these folks' hands. Like, I'm a libertarian uh, for the most part, right? I think most drugs should be legal. I, I think we should have full information about them. I don't think we should actually be much of a nanny state uh, on that stuff. But we should not be subsidizing it and paying for it and, and putting it into people's hands, particularly with money that is expressly to keep their cells healthy and nourish their bodies. So it's just a total gaslighting and perversion of this free market argument to say that to, to question companies rigging the system, you know, to question that as being an anti-state. So, so, so I think we, we've rigged these words and terms on both the left and the right, right? You know, we've talked about weaponizing the, the civil rights groups, but on the right, you actually have well-meaning people on the right saying it's a nanny state action you know, to, 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 to not have folks be able to buy Coke on food stamps. No, no, the nanny state action is, is subsidizing diabetes water. Um, and what's, what's enraging about this is, is you know, we, we have to understand the most powerful force in this world is dopamine. Um, you know, whatever socioeconomic bracket you're at, your, your life is w walking from one dopamine fix to the next. And no judgment on that, but we wake up, we check our phones, we drink caffeine, we drink alcohol, we take pharmaceutical drugs, we take illegal drugs, we watch porn, we watch social media. It, everything is dopamine. And, 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 and we just have to understand, just because it's normalized, just because I watched Coke pay tens of millions of dollars to influence and lobby for Coke to be in schools and hospitals to normalize it in these institutions we trust and that it's normal and that, you know, kids drink it at birthday parties and, and eat a bunch of sugar. It doesn't mean it's not a highly addictive, dangerous drug. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not patriarchal at all. It's just like, we shouldn't be subsidizing that for, 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 for folks. And, and we should be slanting all levers of health and food policy to ask one question, which is how does this help somebody sell and how does this make food less addictive and, and, and more nourishing to our metabolic health? Yeah. Yeah. I love this so much yeah. because I'm a big fan, same as us having the ability to, to freely choose, right? Sure. Whether it's freedom of speech or whether it's freedom of what we eat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're existing in a reality, however, where there's this invisible hand that's yes. putting the choice in front of you. Like this is the choice and our government, we, we have a structure where our government is funding the, number one, they're funding, <laughs> I shared this, this study yeah. to start the episode, right. funding disease creation essentially with these higher rates of obesity and insulin resistance and all these things right. through government subsidized food consumption, right? right? So funding disease, but also our government is putting these particular foods front and center. They, they have the buying power. And when I say a government, this is the thing that I was hesitant to say. This is our money. Yeah. We're paying for this and we don't realize it. Again, we think that we have freedom of choice. Right. But there's this invisible hand that's putting the choice in front of you. Right. And our government is structured in such a way and our system of food and, and health care is structured in a way where we don't realize that it's happening. We think we have the illusion that we're making a, a choice that we have freedom of choice. Going back to my story growing up in that environment, I didn't know. I had no clue oh, yeah. that there was a difference between, you know, uh, fish sticks mm -hmm. and wild caught salmon. It's just something you eat. I had no idea that there was a difference even with, like I, if I'm drinking soda or juice, I, if I'm exercising, I'm healthy, right? It's just something you drink, it's just calories. I didn't understand that there was a difference in any of this stuff. My diet was predominantly ultra processed food and people 
Again, I don't think that we really understand how pervasive this issue is. Mm -hmm. With children here in the United States, and there was this, again, meta-analysis done by JAMA recent, recently published. These researchers detailed that this, they were looking at young people between the ages of 2 and 19 over the past 20 years. And what they found was that ultra-processed food consumption went from an already staggering 61% of our children's diet to being an alarming 67% of the average American child's diet is made of ultra-processed food. So I'm not alone in me saying that the majority of my diet was, wasn't even real food. And it was these sugar-laden, ultra-processed, highly refined, government-subsidized foods. We had the illusion of choice, but it wasn't really freedom of choice. This is so important to unpack because it's, this is a politically confounding topic. It's cross-partisan. It's multi, it, 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 this is just foundational first order to me, public policy. Um, and again, these, these ideas are weaponized. Like I'm again, all for capitalism and I'm, I'm not actually questioning in my opinion, the capitalist structure. I'm actually saying we've been totally hijacked. Um, our ca I, I fully support a free market of choice, um, where externalities and the corporate prices are baked in to the price that we pay for. I believe this isn't what doctors taught, but I believe that the vast majority of Americans want to be healthy, uh, want to have a healthy, happy life, want to live and be vibrant for milestones for their children and grandchildren, want their children to be happy. Systematically, that is not what's happening. Systematically, right, 80% of Americans right now are overweight or obese, and moms are feeding their children poison, like, like on a systematic degree, and children, are systematically overweight and obese. It's like, we're not evolutionarily trying to shorten and torture our lives and the lives of our children. There's like powerful, powerful corruptions, um, lack of education, you know, the incentives run, run everywhere um, to, to really short change like core evolutionary functions of humans, which is to like, I think live a happier and better life and like pass that on to their children. So like, you know, I've been for a long time more, you know, a personal choice guy. Um, I'm actually less on less on that now on food. I actually think, you know, people should be angry. <laughs> like, I, I really do think the system is very rigged to a degree that, you know, I, I don't think 80% of Americans who are overweight or 93% who are metabolically dysfunctional, I don't think they're systematically trying to kill themselves. I, I think actually we should take a little bit of empowerment. We've got to, we've got to make choices and we've got to take this information, do things, you know, personally. But like the system is like totally, totally screwed against us. So this segues back to the fact that when I said my choices of either fish sticks or wild caught salmon and not knowing the difference, also in that conversation is what was I actually exposed to? The wild caught salmon wasn't in my reality, right? I was inundated and surrounded by these ultra processed foods. Mm -hmm. And so those are the choices that I'm inherently going to make because it's what I'm surrounded by. And the reason that these foods can be so cheap, for example, like the question for me inherently when i start to realize this stuff is like why can i get two cheeseburgers from mcdonald's for two dollars but i'm trying to buy some you know an organic avocado and it costs two dollars or two dollars and fifty cents why is this more doesn't this just grow on a tree or fall off a tree and then it got me into like understanding just how cost intensive also it is to make a mcdonald's cheeseburger right we've got all these different facets of somewhat food right we've got the burger ish part going on we've got the dairy ish and i'm i'm mm -hmm. saying this because the cheese that they're using can't legally be called cheese it's cheese product it's yes, soybean oil <laughs> there's not enough cheese in the cheese right you know the the bread product the condiments the wrapping mm -hmm. the the packaging the marketing right. all of these things that are so cost intensive how is this thing cheaper than an avocado and mm -hmm. it goes back to government subsidies. 100%. And I, and I think um, it's a big one. So, so just stepping back, the food stamps is one illustrious example, right? That $110 billion program. But there are levers all over the system where we are massively subsidizing food that is killing us. And if you step back and let's go into the subsidies, think just for a second about the public policy insanity here where we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars 
to subsidize the cellular information, this processed crap going into our bodies that's leading then to trillions of dollars of downstream healthcare costs. I don't think any doctor is disagreeing that the chronic conditions wrought by food, you know, is the bulk by some accounts, 85 to 90% of healthcare spending. I don't think actually when pressed, most doctors even deny that if you changed our food to supply, if you cut out the added sugars, the, the, the inflammatory seed oils, the highly processed grains, that you would essentially eliminate not only diabetes and heart disease, which are essentially entirely foodborne illnesses, but also Alzheimer's, which is now called type 3 diabetes, which is highly tied to diabetes, many different forms of cancer, which are inter completely interlinked with diabetes, kidney disease, COVID deaths. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. So it's so, so you're, we're subsidizing the food that is causing like uh, really our budget to be bankrupted. You know, and the most inconscionable policy we have is these grain and corn subsidies. You know, you mentioned, you know, why the avocado is more expensive. 80% of our subsidies, our, our farm subsidies go to the basically the crops that form seed oils, highly processed grains, and then corn, which is then turned into high fructose corn syrup. 0.4% um, of subsidies go to fruits and vegetables, which are labeled as specialty crops. So we completely slant. And then there's a, just a ton of other. I mentioned earlier, you know, government school programs. It's a very high percentage of children in this country depend on schools for their nutrition, and that's subsidized by the government as well. And, you know, we've talked a lot about this, and I know Michelle Obama, you know, pushed this forward, it was unfortunately not very successful. You know, I think we need actually the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Treasury uh, to be taking that mantle up. It, it's actually d decaying our national security. Um, uh, I think it's just 20% of folks who are 21 right now are even eligible to join the military because of fitness standards. It's destroying our budget and um, it's destroying American competitiveness. Um, so so we're, 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 we're criminally, almost from this like insane public policy standpoint, subsidizing and making cheaper the food that's bankrupting our country and making our population non-competitive and destroying our precious human capital and then you mentioned you know s standing there in the store and, and seeing the the cheap processed food the cheap mcdonald's and you mentioned the other factor which is just basic education right mm. and i was recently chatting with a nutritional researcher and uh they told me that i'm getting a lot of interesting dms a lot of messages from folks as i've been on this tirade and studies are actually funded to say like little swaps up the processed food curves. There's actually like an institutional funding to say that it's classist and even racist to tell to, to assume that somebody's go gonna go from like frosted flakes to like broccoli. It's all about like moving from frosted flakes like up to a, like a healthier cereal. Frosted like, mini wheats. Yeah, and, and, and it's like exactly. And, and there's actually, it's, it's actually, you can look at speeches from the White House Conference on Nutrition and all these folks who are heavily paid by food companies. There's this conscious effort to, to say that lower income folks, they're never going to move off processed food. We just have to make processed food a little bit better. You know, and Kellogg's has their, their Frosted Flakes and then they have, you know, the, the, the mini wheats that just yeah. still have, you know, 10 grams of added sugar. It's like, it's moving up the curve and it's, it's just this this nihilism that we're just never going to be off processed food. And, and, you know, I asked, um, why can't we just put the, put the mantle over here? Just, just based on the science, we have to get to a more whole foods diet. Let's stop subsidizing this processed food. Let's, let's, let's start like moving really aggressively and speaking very plainly that we're, we're going to really be hampered as a society unless we do this. Oh, no, you don't understand. You don't understand that, that that's not what we're funded to do. And that's, that's too radical. I'm one of those people. I'm I'm literally one of those people that made that change. You I know? think a lot. I think a lot of people can and want to, Absolutely. but we don't believe in people. The, the system doesn't believe in people. You know, the system doesn't believe in people. You know, Casey talks about at Stanford Med School and in surgical residency, the the disdain for the American patient is off the charts. It's ingrained in doctors. You know, patients are lazy, stupid. They're going to eat their Big Mac, and we're here to clean up the mess. It's it's no belief in in humans. Um, it, it's just ingrained into the, into the system, and um, and that's convenient now that we weaponize food as we talked about to be to be highly addictive. I mean, 
if you give any of us a, a drug that's highly addictive, um, almost against our will, right, and, and subsidize us to have it, you know, you get addicted to things. And, um, and that's kind of what we're doing yeah. to people. And making that jump from Frosted Flakes to Frosted Mini Wheats, yeah. by the way, the Food Compass Nutrient Profiling System, Frosted Mini Wheats was a top tier oh, yeah. food choice superior the researchers gave it nutritional superiority frosted mini, mini wheats over eggs mm -hmm. significantly better mm -hmm. than eggs highly encouraged. ground beef whole dairy all these real simple whole foods this ultra processed food by definition mm -hmm. is a superior food and the framing on that was just absurd. yeah and, and, I don't, and again i i i don't want to make this personal and i think a, a key I think hang up I've had and I think a lot of folks have is that we know professors, we know doctors. There's there's good people in the system. The folks doing that research are good people. But that study was paid for by food companies and it names these cereals by brand. And there are dozens of cereals that are encouraged. It's funded millions of dollars by Danone, which is one of the largest makers of soy milk and almond milk. <sighs> The, this money does have an influence and you know the key is and i think it gets back to this uh, you know do, do we incrementally try to just get a little bit better or do we really have to ask you know what's the radical paradigm shift we have to make here you know do we, we really have to i think start seeing food as as, as medicine like yeah. we're not going to hack our way out of this we're not going to have incremental change you know to, to, to change this. Yeah. And I want to circle back to this point as well. And this was one of the most remarkable things that you brought forward, mm -hmm. which is their playbook. One of their biggest tools in the playbook is distraction and just overall confusion. You know, get people in fighting about silliness and or ignoring their better judgment, right? And distracting people in general. And for example, there's been this huge push right now of reframing chronic diseases to things that are totally without our control, just outside of our control. For example, we'll put these up on the screen for everybody to see. These are real things from reputable organizations. There's research now pointing to climate change is increasing the risk of heart disease. All right, the number one killer in the United States for decades now. It's climate change that's doing it, all right? It has nothing to do with diet and exercise and sleep and getting outdoors and being human. It's climate change, it's not your fault. Also another one, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which is at epidemic proportions. This particular uh, scientific organization, the hypothesis is that IBS is being caused by gravity intolerance, all right? Quote, gravity intolerance is gravity you up it's you being here on earth that's what it is we got to get you off planet to clear up that ibs i will and by the way ibs in some scientific circles it stands for is bull <laughs> i mean as a former practitioner of this misinformation i'm impressed uh to some degree it's to some degree it's just all part of the playbook I mean, you know, we've just heard recently that a uh, leading cause of, of asthma is the gas stoves. <laughs> True. And uh, there's been a lot of news, right, on the gas stoves. And I, I don't know if everyone's seen that, but, you know, there was more news on that topic that I saw in the last week than the exponential increase in autoimmune conditions, you know, and chronic conditions and obesity and fatty liver disease that we're seeing among kids. And again, let's just like, Think about how this happens. You have pharma, just taking pharma, for example, $350 million on lobbying alone, billions of dollars of research funding, billions of dollars of media spending, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of public affairs consulting spending. And it this is not complicated. They literally sit in a room and ask, how can we sow doubt? I'd urge everyone to go look at the, there's a project that has all the tobacco PR documents. It, it, it's written down in paper, yeah. you know, hopefully there'll be a class action lawsuit one day on, uh, on sugar and we'll, we'll, the soda companies and we'll have discovery and be able to see, but, but, but I wrote these documents. It, it's, it's not that complicated. And it's like, how do we confuse? How do we distract people from 
the key issue. You know, you, you have literally the Washington Post, uh, a lead reporter, economics and healthcare reporter for the Washington Post, uh, talk recently about how we, we just don't know what causes childhood obesity. Um, you know, and, and um, again, it's just like, you just, to, just, just drill down, you know, what, what, what is a reporter incentivized? Well, they, they need funding and, and, and a huge portion of the funding comes from pharma and, and also food companies. And they actually also profit and benefit from there being distraction and controversy. Right. Um, That's what they're built on. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I think honest. I think with this content, you know, and even a lot of health influencers I, I, I follow a lot, I think we, we all, you know, are sometimes under disservice because there, there is a huge, there's a huge incentive to overcomplicate the situation a little bit. So this is the journey I'm on. And like my message is like, I really do think, you know, inspired by Casey and being on this journey to, I say to just have more awe about the human body and the yeah. connections within the human body. I, I think it's actually a key to happiness in life. Um, but, but you know, we're, we're, we're systematically, I think, being told not to be on that journey and just be in a state of confusion when we should just be really asking first principle, first principle questions um, and not, you know, taking the word of these, you know, funded studies. Well, I'm very grateful for you joining in this, in this mission because, like I said, I am one of those kids. I come from that environment, and all I needed was awareness. I needed awareness that this existed. I could actually feel good. I could be disease-free. I could create and live my life in the way that I feel is my potential. So giving people that accessibility, but here's another key part of this, is tying it to something that we want and or tying it to something that we value. Once we do that and take the work to do that, it's a game changer. You know, for me, one of the biggest leverages or leverage points for me was my kids. Mm. You know, I was in college barely getting by, hanging on while I'm in so much pain. And I've got my son Jordan, my daughter Jasna, my two oldest kids, and I wanna be there to be a good example for them. Right. And my life is like a shell of what it could be. And so that was a huge leverage point. Another leverage point was, you know, my grandmother who invested so much into me, who gave me opportunity, who taught me the importance of education and really showing up for her and living up to my potential that she saw in me. So these psychological leverage points, we could find those if we take the time to get to know people. Well, I think you hit on something very resonant for me and why I'm in this fight. And it's, I think, something everyone has, which is um, looking at, my parents, you know, my mom was um, my best friend and Casey's best friend, the most vibrant person we knew. And she had a pain in her stomach in 2021, went into the doctor for a scan and learned she had stage four pancreatic cancer. And we rushed to her side and uh, 13 days later, she was dead. And those 13 days were the most profound and actually positive it's weird to say of my life and Casey's life and the most affirming of our life. Um, she, uh, her house was stacked with, with your book, with, with, with books by Mark Hyman, Rob Lustig, Sarah Gottfried on down folks who've been really speaking and been at the forefront of this fight to talk about the interconnections of health and metabolic health. She was one of the 50% of Americans with pre-diabetes and was really working on that over the, previous years, it ended up being a little late, you know, she had that unknown, unbeknownst to her that, uh, that cancer was growing inside her before she even started on this journey. It was growing in there for years, but, but just her being on that journey inspired me and Casey. And I really do feel, and Casey feels like she lives inside us now. Yeah. Um, and you know, you don't know how much time you have here, but just that act of, so, so, so we were, yeah. In, in a weird, we're just watching how she handled herself. She was in constant state of improvement and just her in her final days being surrounded by th hundreds of letters from people that she impacted. You know, we took that and feel like she lives uh, inside of us now. And then, you know, taking that just, just less than a year later, having my, my first son. Um, and you know, it, it, it's a basic, a lot, a lot, most of us have parents, many of us have kids and, you know, but like, there's preciousness and profound, I think, insights looking at that perfect little child like walking into this world where I think kids are being fed into an absolute buzzsaw right now. And um, and I think a lot of people are waking up. It is really motivating. 
but um, you know, to, 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 to change. But I think a key part of some of my messages, a key part is believing in yourself, believing in your own common sense. You know, a key cause, you know, which I think any scientist will tell you or a doctor of all these chronic conditions is, is what we call inflammation. But I don't think a lot of people ask what that inflammation is. Inflammation is actually usually a good thing. Um, right, it's, it's our body summoning forces to kind of attack something that's foreign in our body, right? I, I think in science classes, you know, usually, usually that 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 is actually good. Right now, we're in a constant state of inflammation. Why? Because we have foreign substances in our body. Our body is literally reacting to the food we're eating as foreign invaders. That it, they're in a constant state of alarm to attack. Um, it's pretty simple. And I don't know, you know, people can use that. It, it is. You know, I, I know I have some gall as a not a doctor coming on here and saying this, but like th this is, you know, this is my journey I've been on, um, you know, reading, you know, all, all the, you know, books by, by so many of the folks that have been on your show and you and, and just like you can kind of trust yourself a little bit. And, you know, I, I'm just trying to bring my perspective on um, it's it's as bad as you think as far as the, the, the rigged uh, the rigged system and. But I am hopeful about looking forward. Um, you know, I, I think there's an empowerment, but I, but I think I think there's a couple other um, moves we can make as society that I think are going to make um, that I'm, I'm getting a little bit of insight on uh, during this journey. Yeah. Happy to talk about. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like you said, there's this inner intelligence, there's mm. an innate intelligence mm. that, you know, this is something that we have instant access to all the time. And you're somebody, your work and where you've directed directed your attention recently is working in a way to help to create a system that is incentivizing health. So can you talk about where people can get more information, where they can follow you and stay up to date with what you're doing? Yeah, I think understanding the dynamics we're talking about is the baseline to change them. So, um, you know, after the experience with my mom and, and learning from Casey, I had one question. It's a very simple question. But I think it's a question thousands of people are asking, and we've got to chip away at in a million different ways. Uh, but it's how do we incentivize people to be healthy? <laughs> right now, the American patient, an American, has four trillion dollars of incentives of the healthcare industry against them, and and I think six trillion dollars of the food system against them. You know, ninety five percent of healthcare spending is after people get sick. We're incentivized. This system is incentivized for people to be sick. Okay, how do we change that? Um, I investigated that with a, with a good friend, Justin Maris, who started Kettle and Fire, Perfect Keto, two, two great healthy food brands. Pa he passed those off. Like, how do we devote our lives to this issue? Yeah, our quick solution is um, these FSA, HSA accounts. So the majority of Americans have them. There's $140 billion seeing them right now. They're, they're accounts that you can use um, a, a, as you want for qualified health expenses. Most people you know, in their 20s, 30s, and 40s don't actually use them because they're seen as these accounts for when you get sick. But I think that's part of the problem with how we see healthcare. We're kind of waiting to get sick. You can actually use them to prevent conditions. And with a note from a provider, food and exercise can count. So as we know, uh, food and exercise and, and this isn't just a talking point. You, could, you actually have thousands of studies. Take any chronic condition and put a food intervention, exercise intervention, getting some better nutrients through the supplements, a holistic strategy with that versus the leading pharmaceutical care. You want to compare stands versus, versus a dietary intervention for heart disease. Any condition. We've, we've worked with a clinical team. We, we've actually cataloged every chronic condition. And we're going to easily issue those food prescriptions which then, as a family, you can max out $7,200 to these tax-free accounts and buy whatever you're qualified for there with exercise, groceries uh, for your family. Um, and that $7,200, depending on your tax rate, you know, that could be thousands of dollars worth of savings. It's pre-income tax. Um, so, I, you know, it's material. It's, it's, you know, it's thousands of dollars of, you know, you know, it starts bending that cost curve, you know, fighting back against these subsidies, starts making that avocado a little bit more of a parody um, with uh, with the Big Mac. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's how we're pushing on this. W what I hope, you know, is that, that folks join us. It's truemedicine.care. I'm on Twitter, Callie Means. We're talking about this. We're launching in a couple months. 
Um, we're trying to build a community who cares about this, you know, seamlessly save them money. But, but what I hope it does is present a model for public policy, you know, th th a model for food stamps, a model for um, really disrupting many healthcare apparatuses. I mean, what if we replaced all the money we spend on doctor's offices, you know, with an app that, that knows your glucose levels, that's tied into your biowearables, that can actually suggest targeted food interventions, what you should be eating and provide savings on that, you know, and, and actually tell you that, hey, if you don't exercise, you, you your, your blood pressure is going up, you might actually, you know, you might actually get a chronic condition. I, I, I think there's this world, you know, with, with, with what we're doing and what biowearables are doing is where when we really like have actual information about what we should eat, um, you know, the metabolic actions we should take. And then we just, the, the, the missing part is we need to tie public policy to, to incentivize. So that's where we're starting. Um, you know, and, and I, my, my partner, Justin, you know, inspired by Casey, inspired by you, inspired by, by leaders in this fight, want to be soldiers in this effort to, to move incentives more towards uh, metabolic solutions, which is, which is, I, I think existential for the country. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you state the website one more time? Uh, truemedicine.care truemedicine.care yes. Kylie Means on Twitter yes man you're phenomenal thank you so much thank you, again Sean. truly so for grateful for you being a part of this mission and it's super inspiring and I'm grateful first and foremost for you stepping up to help to create a solution that's what it's really all about at this point and you know again thank you so much thank for you. being who you are Thank you, Sean. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. And you see that your blood sugar goes up 80 points, which would be a really high rise. You can say immediately in, in one time of just checking this food with your continuous glucose monitor, this food is likely causing a big insulin surge in me. And we know that one of the many functions of insulin is that it blocks fat burning in the body. 